this lesson. I'm teacher Agnes and today we are going to be talking about transmission of pressure in liquids. In the previous lesson, we learned how to calculate pressure that is exerted by liquids and we say that pressure in liquids is given by the height times the density times the gravitational force. Now, can this pressure be transmitted? Can it move from one region to the other? Yes, it can move. So pressure, I want you to imagine you are using your toothpaste. Let us assume that is, this is the toothpaste tube. The way you use it in the morning or in the evening, if you press the bottom of the toothpaste, the toothpaste comes out from the top. Okay, so you press from the bottom, but the toothpaste comes out at the top. Why does that happen? So when you press, you exert pressure on the toothpaste, okay? Now the same pressure is transmitted throughout the entire toothpaste until some of it comes out from the tube. So we are saying that if you have an enclosed liquid and then you apply pressure on one part of that enclosed liquid, the same amount of pressure will be transmitted to all the other parts of the enclosed liquid. Same case when you are using, you know, your soap to clean your hands after using the washroom before taking a meal. I have this soap here, and if I want to, you know, produce the soap from this tube, then I'll have to press at this position. So what does that do? When I press here, I create, or rather, I exert pressure. When I exert pressure, the same amount of pressure is transmitted equally to all the other parts of this tube until the liquid soap comes out of the segment. You see, I'm not pressing from here. I am pressing from here, and then I am creating pressure here, and the same amount of pressure is transmitted all over the liquid until, you know, when this pressure, this need for an escape route. So until the same pressure makes the liquid so to come out from the opening so if you have to use it you press from here and then you know it comes out from the tube now this transmission of pressure in liquids is a principle that guides the transmission of pressure in liquids and this principle is known as pascal's principle so it is either known as the principle of transmission of pressure or Pascal's principle. Why Pascal? Because Pascal is a person who came up with this theory. Now, what does it state? Like we have said, it states that pressure applied at one part of an enclosed liquid is transmitted equally to all other parts of the enclosed liquid. If you press the toothpaste tube from the bottom, you exert pressure. That pressure will be transmitted equally without losing any of it to all the other parts of that toothpaste tube. So pressure applied at one part of an enclosed liquid is transmitted equally to all other parts of the enclosed liquid. So today go and try that to your toothpaste and observe that. Now, can this apply to gases? So this principle can apply in gases given that two conditions are met. If the gas is confined in a container and if the gas is incompressible, what does that mean? You know, the air that we have around us is not confined in a container. So this principle cannot apply there. But if you have, okay, if you have the air confined in a container, like in a tire, a car tire or a bicycle tire, okay if you have the air confined there and have it compressed to the maximum it can get such that if you compress it doesn't compress any further then this principle can apply now let us take this glass to be our container this glass has air in it but the air inside this container is not compressed to the maximum if i was to close it and continue applying pressure the air will continue to occupy the smallest area possible or the smallest volume possible. But you'll get to a point where it cannot be compressed any further. 
So at that point now, we say that the gas is incompressible. And during that time, it can obey the principle of transmission of pressure. Now, why is this transmission of pressure necessary? Why is it applied in real life? So in real life, we have hydraulic machines, okay? We have hydraulic machines that operate based on this principle, hydraulic machines. So we are now going to discuss the two types of hydraulic machines that rely on this principle of transmission of pressure. All right, now we have two types of hydraulic machines that, that operate on the principle of Pascal. Now, I want you to remember that the reason why we use machines is to make work easier. So a hydraulic lift, I know you have seen it, you may just not know where you have seen it. If you go to a garage, you find that a vehicle can be raised at the top and the mechanics are operating, you know, it from the bottom. So the machine that is used to raise those vehicles to the top is called a hydraulic lift. Now, a hydraulic brake system is a braking system of a car. When you are driving and you want the car to come to a stop, you press on the brake on the brake pedal. Now, when you press, you, when you press on the brake pedal, after a short while, the car comes to a stop. Now, that brake system of a car is called the hydraulic brake system and it operates on the principle of Pascal's principle. Now let us begin by discussing the hydraulic lift. How does it look like? So a hydraulic lift looks like this. Okay. So like you can see here, we have two pistons. We have the smaller side and the bigger side. Now the bigger side is where you place your load. Okay, so this is where you place your load, maybe a car or something that is very heavy. Then at this point is where you apply your force. Okay, this is where you apply your force. Now, we say that machines make work easier. So if I want to lift a very big car that has, a, you know, a lot of weight, then I need to come up with a way of using very little Force, force or effort for me to be able to raise the car up. So what happens here, if you notice where the force is being applied, the area is also very small. So let us assume the force at this point is something that, you know, you can easily apply as a human being, let's say 200 newtons, okay? And this area is very small. So let's say the area here is equal to one meter, squared. Now let's proceed to this other side. A car can weigh as much as let's say 20,000 newtons. Okay? That is the possible weight of a car. And then the area here, like you can see, it is huge. The area is bigger. So let's say here we have an area of 100 meter squared. So you notice here we are playing with the area. Remember what we say, that area affects the amount of pressure that is produced. So now, if we were to calculate the pressure on this side, on the smaller side, you realize that the pressure here will be equal to force over area, 200 newtons over one meter squared, which is equal to 200 pascals. On the other side, pressure is equal to force over area. So 20,000 over 100, and this will also be equal to 200 pascals. So notice that when you have small figures, you are getting the pressure as 200 pascals. When you have big figures, you're also getting the pressure at, at 200 pascals. So it is possible to create pressure from this side by applying a small amount of force on a small area, have that pressure transmitted all the way to the other side and raise the load, okay? Remember here we are transmitting pressure. So inside here, we will need to have a liquid. 
So for you to use less force, then you must apply your force on a small area. By that, you create pressure. The same amount of pressure that you create is transmitted equally to the other side. But when it comes to this region, it spreads over a big area and is therefore able to raise a very heavy object. So now, what you need to note is that the pressure on this side, okay? If this is P1 and this is P2, the pressure applied on this side as P1 will be the same pressure experienced on this side as P2. So it is okay to say that in this case, P1 is equal to P2. Pressure in this region is equal to pressure in this region. But how do we calculate the pressure in this first region? We have a force being applied on a small area. So we can call that force 1 over area 1. Remember, pressure is equal to force over area. So force 1 over area 1, which is equal to pressure 2, is given by, we have another force here and another area. So this is force 2 over area 2. So whenever we are doing questions regarding the hydraulic lift, these two are the formulas that we must consider. Okay? So to apply this, we are going to attempt a question together. In this question, we have been given a diagram of a hydraulic lift and on the smaller piston, we have F1, which has a force of 100 newtons and area 1 is 0 0.25 meters square. And then on the other side of the bigger piston, we have force 2 and an area of 10 meters squared. And now the question needs us to calculate the value of force 2. Now, before you apply the formula, always make sure that the area given, the areas given are in the SI units. And since both of our areas are in meters squared, we will proceed to use the formula. So do you remember the formula that relates F1, A1, F2, and A2? So we say that the pressure at this region, which is P1, is equal to the pressure at this region, which is P2. Pressure in region 1 is given by force in region 1 over the area in region 1, and this will be equal to the force in region 2 over the area in region 2. So now we're going to substitute. F1 is given as 100 newtons over area 1, which is 0 0.25 meters squared. And this is equal to force 2 over area 2, which is 10 meters squared. So now we want to obtain the value of F2. What do we do? We cross multiply so that F2 will be equal to 100 newtons times 10 meters squared divided by the 0 0.25 meters squared. Meters squared will cancel out and then here we have 100 newtons times 10, that's 1000 um, newtons divided by 0 0.25. So 1,000 newtons divided by 0 0.25, and that will be equal to 40,000 newtons. So the force that is on the second region is equal to 40,000 newtons. So you can see how we are using a very small force of 100 newtons on a small area to raise a very big load spread on a large area. Example 2, we are going to look at another question, a sketch of a hydraulic lift. In this case, we have a small piston, which is section A, with a force of 50 newtons and an area of 2 centimeters squared. Then we have the bigger piston, where we have the load that is supposed to be raised, and the area on which it has been placed is 100 centimeters squared. Now the question requires that we calculate the pressure at A, the force at B, and the mass of the load to be raised. Now at A, we have a force of 50 newtons and an area of 2 centimeters squared. 
Now, there's one thing that you must do before applying the formula. We know that both force and area must be in the SI unit. So we need to convert two centimeters squared to meter squared, okay? So we know that one meter squared is equal to 10,000 centimeters squared. So what about two centimeters squared? If you cross multiply, that is one times two over 10,000, which is equal to 0 0.0002 meters squared. Now, since we have converted our area into meters squared, we can now go ahead and calculate the pressure at A. We know that pressure is equal to force over area. The force at A is 50 newtons, and the area is 0 0.0002 meters squared. Now, using your calculator, you can divide 50 by 0 0.0002, and you will obtain 250,000 newton per meter squared. You can also write the units as Pascal. Now, having calculated the pressure at A, it is important to remember that the hydraulic lift works on the principle of the principle of transmission of pressure, which states that pressure applied at one part of the enclosed liquid is transmitted equally to all the other parts of the enclosed liquid. So what is the value of pressure at B? It is the same as the value of pressure at A, which is two which is 250,000 pascals. So since we have the pressure and we have the area, we can determine the force at B. Now we need to convert that area into meters squared first. So like we have seen here, converting from centimeter squared to meter squared, you divide by 10,000. So we are going to divide 100, so this is our area, over 10,000, and this will be equal to 0 0.01 meter squared. So now we have the area and we have the pressure. Can we get force? Of course, yes. So from our triangle that relates the relationship between pressure, force, and area, we know that force is equal to pressure times the area. So this will be equal to the pressure is 250,000 times the area, which is 0 0.01. So if you multiply this, you will be able to obtain a force of 2,500 newtons. Now, after obtaining your force, we can now be able to answer part C, where we are required to determine the mass of the load. Remember this force at B, 2,500 newtons, represents the weight of the load. Now, weight and mass are related. And in our previous topic, we discussed that weight is equal to mass times gravitational force. So the weight is 2,500 newtons, which is equal to the mass we don't know, times the gravitational force on Earth, which is 10. So if you want to obtain weight, if you want to obtain mass from this equation, then we have to divide by 10 on both sides, okay? So here the zeros will cancel out, and then we will have a mass of 250 kilograms. So the mass of the load that is being weighed at B is 250 kilograms. So let us look at one more example. So now we are going to work out this question. Like you can see, we also have a sketch of a hydraulic lift. We have two sides, the smaller piston and the bigger piston. On the smaller piston, which is A, we have 120 newtons being applied on an area of 0 0.06 meter squared. And then on the bigger piston, which is region B, we have a load and the area in B is 0 0.5 meter squared. Now, we are required to calculate two quantities. One, the pressure in A, 
then two, the load at B. So we are going to begin by calculating the pressure at A. So this is region A. When you look at region A, we have a force of 120 newtons acting on an area of 0 0.06 meters squared. Now, is there a relationship between pressure, force, and area? Yes, there is. And that relationship is that pressure is equal to force over area. So in this region A, the amount of force is 120 newtons and the area is 0 0.06 meter squared. So all you need to do is to divide 120 by 0 0.06 so that you get 20,000 pascals, okay? So for you to calculate pressure, what you need is force over area, the force in region A, where we need the pressure is 120, and then the area is 0 0.06. When you divide, you get 20,000 pascals. Now the next question is asking for the load at B. The load at B, meaning the force at B. Now in region B, we already have the area. What else do we have? Remember we know the pressure at A is 20,000 pascals. And this pressure is being applied on region A. And we know that pressure applied at one point of an enclosed liquid is transmitted equally to all the other parts of the enclosed liquid. So what does that tell you about the pressure at B? The pressure at B is the same as the pressure at A. So for region B, we know the pressure and we know the area. What we need is the load, which is the force. Now, from our beautiful triangle that relates pressure, force, and area, we know that force is equal to pressure times the area. So the pressure is 20,000, and the area is 0 0.5. So when you multiply the two, you get 10,000 newtons. So the load being raised at region P uh, at region B has a weight of 10,000 newtons. So I hope you have understood how to work out questions relating to hydraulic brakes. Now we are going to discuss how does the hydraulic brake system work? What happens from the moment you step on the brake pedal in a car to the moment it comes to a stop? Which science happens there? Now we are going to discuss what happens from the moment you press on the brake pedal to the moment when the car stops and then when it starts, you know, moving again. Now, like you can see here, we have the brake pedal. After the brake pedal, we have the master cylinder here. Inside, we have the brake fluid, and this is the path to all the other wheels. Remember, most cars have four wheels, and others like lorries have more than four wheels. So the whole of this system is connected together. Then now, uh, the brake fluid goes into another slave cylinder, meaning that this is a smaller one, the master cylinder is bigger. Now the slave cylinder is connected to the brake shoe, okay? This region here is the brake shoe, and then after the brake shoe, we have the brake lining, and after the brake, uh, after the brake lining, we have the drum, okay? And then in the middle here, we have the return wheel. And then at this point here, we have the pivot. You know, the pivot is where, you know, the, the brake shoe is held in place, okay? Now, when you press on the brake pedal, you apply force. When force is applied on an area, it creates pressure. So when pressure is created from the brake pedal, that pressure is felt here in the master cylinder. And since there's a fluid inside, the same amount of pressure is transmitted equally to all the other wheels. Remember, according to Pascal's principle, pressure applied at one point of an enclosed liquid is transmitted equally to all the other points of the enclosed liquid. So when pressure is transmitted by the brake fluid, it goes all the way to the slave cylinder. At this point, this pressure needs an exit. So what happens is that this pressure pushes the, the brake shoe 
to open. So the way they are right now, they open. When they open, remember they have a pivot here. That's why they are able to open. So when they open, they press the brake lining, okay? And the brake lining presses the drum, which resists the motion of the wheel. Let me repeat. When a force is applied on the brake pedal, on this area, pressure is created. The pressure is felt on the master cylinder, where it is transmitted equally to all the other wheels into the slave cylinder of each wheel. Now, this pressure here will make the brake shoe to open. When the brake shoe opens, it presses the brake lining, and the brake lining presses the outer part of the wheel, which is the drum, resisting its motion. And when motion is resisted, what happens? The wheel will stop rotating, and the car will come to a stop. So what happens if you release your foot from the brake pedal? If you release your foot from the brake pedal, there will no longer be force on the brake pedal. If there is no force, there is no pressure. So there will be no pressure in the master cylinder, neither will there be pressure in the slave cylinder. If there is no pressure, then it means that the brake shoe, the brake lining, and the drum will go back to their original position. So the return wheel is the one that brings back the brake shoe to its original position, which in turn brings the brake lining to its original position. And then, since the drum is not pressed, there is no resistance of its motion. And if there is no resistance in the motion, then it means that the wheel can continue to rotate and the car will continue to move. So all you need to remember here is that the wheels are operating on the principle of Pascal and all the four wheels will have the same thing happening at the same time because they are all connected to the master cylinder. So when pressure is applied here, it will be transmitted to all the wheels at the same rate and in equal measure. Okay. So that is what happens when a uh, braking occur, bringing it to a stop. And if you need to resume motion, uh, the opposite happens, which we have discussed. So I hope you have understood this. But now, there's one more thing that we need to discuss. This fluid that we use in the brake system, is it water? What type of a fluid is it? So this fluid must have three characteristics for it to be used in the brake system, and that is what we are going to discuss next. Now, for a fluid to be considered a brake fluid, then it must have these three properties. Number one, it should be should be incompressible. Okay, it should be incompressible. So the reason for this is to ensure that when pressure is applied on one part of the enclosed liquid, it will be transmitted equally to all the other parts of the liquid. Because if it is compressible and then you apply pressure on it, that pressure will be used to minimize the space occupied by that fluid. But if it is incompressible, if you apply pressure on one side, that same amount of pressure will be transmitted equally to all the other parts of the enclosed liquid. And this is very important because I want you to imagine like in the case of the four wheels in a small car, and then you apply, you know, you press the brake pedal. And then the fluid used, in that case, if it is compressible, then it means all the four wheels will not receive the same amount of pressure. So can you imagine one? So if the fluid is compressible, and then you apply pressure in the master cylinder, then that means that all the four wheels will not receive the same amount of pressure. So can you imagine in a scenario where one wheel has stopped rotating, but the other three are still rotating? That would actually cause an accident. So it is important that the brake fluid is incompressible so that the pressure applied in one part of the enclosed liquid is transmitted equally to all the other parts, in this case, to all the other wheels. Number two, it should have should have a wide range of temperature. 
What does it mean? This means that the difference between the melting point and the boiling point is high. So in this case, the fluid should have a low freezing point and a high boiling point because if a fluid freezes, it, if a liquid freezes, it becomes a, a solid. And if it boils, it becomes a, a gas. So it should have a wide range of temperature so that in case, you know something like a car gets heated, so that when it gets heated, it doesn't evaporate and become a gas because if it does, then the function, it will not be able to perform its function. So this fluid should have a wide range of temperature or you can say that it should have a very low freezing point and a high boiling point. And finally, it should be non-corrosive. It should not corrode the parts of the brake system. So we have other parts of the brake system that are in contact with the brake fluid. If it is corrosive, it will eat those parts away and the car, you know, will wear out. And that is not what we want. So for any fluid to qualify to be a brake fluid, it must be incompressible, have a wide range of temperature, and be non-corrosive. So I hope you have understood the two types of machines that rely on the Pascal's principle or the principle of transmission of pressure. So now I'm going to give you a question that you're going to use to test whether you have understood the contents of this lesson. Now learners, for your exercise, attempt these three questions. One, state the principle of transmission of pressure. The other name for the principle of transmission of pressure is the Pascal's principle. Then highlight three properties of a brake fluid. And then given this diagram, calculate the value of A2. Now I hope that you have learned something quite practical in this lesson. If you have a car at home, ask your parent to show you how they apply brakes on the vehicles and then try to explain to them how that actually happens. Okay? Thank you for being in this lesson and see you in the next lesson.